Marshall Ryan Maresca is the traditionally published author of 12 fantasy novels. His fantasy world began in 1993 with the drawing of a map that evolved over the years until finally, in 2007, he had a clear concept for his novels. Hedging his bets, Marshall had three series starters written or in progress by the time he landed his first book deal. When we talked, it was clear that Marshall is still fired up about his creative process and shows no signs of slowing down. To learn more about today's guest, his thoughts on remaining relevant in the fantasy genre, and his world-building podcast, be sure to listen to today's episode of the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. In exchange for your support on Patreon, you'll receive monthly one-on-one sessions with yours truly. I'm a certified master life coach, and I've worked with best-selling authors, award-winning filmmakers, and everything in between. Here's a testimonial from USA Today best-selling author Nick Thacker, as read by me. I have a lot of irons in the fire because I'm more than an author. I'm a creative. The only downside? it's easy to get overwhelmed and fall back into old patterns. Ethan's doing important work. When he offered to help me declutter and focus, I was all in. He helped me get clear about how to manage my capacity and to prioritize my cue. My business continues to move forward, but now I'm better at managing my energy and expectations, and that's helped immensely with the anxiety. If you need help laying the foundation of your author business so that you can get sustainable results without the overwhelm, I highly recommend his services. Thank you, Nick. Help fund the show today and get the support you need to take the next step forward on your own unique journey as a storyteller. Again, visit patreon.com forward slash Ethan Frackleton. All right, enough with that. On to today's show. Marshall Ryan Maresca, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller podcast. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk with anybody about about the craft of storytelling and and the process we go through when we do this sort of thing. Yeah, that's perfect. And so, for people who may not know who you are, uh, what would you like to share about yourself? Well, my name is Marshall Ryan Maresca. I am primarily a fantasy novelist. I as of this recording, am most known for writing the novels of the Meridane Saga, which is four series braided together into a larger saga. And those each book in those there's three books in each of those series that all come together in the most recent book. And those books are mm-hmm. The Thorn of Denton Hill, A Murder of Mages, Whole Valley Crew, The Way of the Shield, The Alchemy of Chaos, An Import of Intrigue, Lady Hinterman's Wardrobe, Shield of the People, <laughs> and <laughs> The Imposters of Avenue. Now I lost track and I'm like, um, I was very impressed. That's, that's why I was laughing. I was like, no, I know, yeah. but it's, it's also. When, I mean, you reach the point where you have to be able to just rattle it off like that. Sure. Um, and then the Imposters of Aventil, a Parliament of Bodies, the Fenmere job, and then People of the City, where all four of the series come together. And in a few weeks from this recording, on February 9th, my first book that is not set in Meridane, mm. which is The Velocity of Revolution, comes out. Mm. That is a diesel punk fantasy with uh, motorcycle races and magical mushrooms and a undercover cop with a rebel's voice in his head. And so was be... that like just a total palate cleanser? Is... It was a total palate cleanser. Like <laughs> only I would be crazy enough to be like first write 12 books to come out within a five and a half year period that mm. are all tied together. And then, and then be like, so now as a break, 
I will write a completely different, like, completely different place. Um, most yeah. people just actually take a break, but that's just not how my brain wanted to work. So, but yeah, okay. I did write this very different, very kind of fantasy as like just to to reset my brain and right. just be thinking about something else. Cool and. Um, rhetorical question for me, not for listeners. Are you traditionally published or independent? Traditionally published. All my books are through DAW, hmm. which, and my editor is the great Sheila Gilbert, who is a two time Hugo winner for best uh, nice. long form editor. So nice. And she's fabulous and lets me do all these crazy things that I imagine. I mean, <laughs> that's quite that's quite the team you've got in, yes. in your corner. I've been very blessed. Yeah. So you know, still skimming the surface here. So 12 books released in five and a half years. Was that written relatively in a short period of time too? Or was um, this some big concept that you've been holding on to before you got started? So I, the big concept like just first hit me, I want to say in 2007, Mm -hmm. And like, I just started writing the notes for that. And I wrote the draft of Thorn of Denton Hill, like over the course of 2008, if memory mm. serves. And that draft, like, you know, then did a lot of editing and a lot of shopping and all of that. And mm. so then while I was, you know, starting the process of like sending that, you know, after I had done some editing passes of sending that to, uh, to agents, you know, mm -hmm. doing doing the query process, I started writing Whole Valley Crew. And then when that was done and my querying process hadn't quite set in yet, I wrote Murder of Mages. And by the time I was done with that, I had secured an agent and then wrote Way of the Shield while everything was shopping. So by the time... So I sold Thorn of Denton Hill and Murder of Mages at the same time. And by the time mm -hmm. that sold, I had had all four of these first books of each series already ready to go. So I at least had that as a, 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 as a foundation. So did you know, I... did you know all, all along that this was going to be a big intricate interwoven set of series? Was that part of the design or? That was part of the design, but also part of the design was the idea that was the realism that maybe I wouldn't be able to do it as mm -hmm. a big, intricate, interwoven set of series. So, which is why I kept writing new book ones, because I knew, like, I couldn't just be like, well, see, I knew, like, I couldn't just be like, well, now this is shopping out and I just have to sit and wait. Like, I'm like, no, I have to write the next, another book. But, like, if I had written... The Alchemy of Chaos then, which is the yeah. second book of the Thorn series, then like I would have like if I never was able to sell Thorn, then that would have just been time not exactly mm. well spent. Whereas by continuing to write another book one, each one being a thing that could be sold by itself if the other ones hadn't sold. So yeah. that was that was a thesis behind continuing to write these first of first of each series at mm. the time. And then once I had myself established with, with Daw and with my editor that, you know, I was able to go like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, I want to do this one next. And they're like, okay, great. You know, whatever. And then it's like, okay, so I've got this fourth series that I've already got the first book done. You want that now? And they're like, okay, we'll do, we'll now we'll, we've established enough with the other ones that we can do that now. So that's yeah. part of how the, the order of release got established mm -hmm. by, by, we first just did those first two thorn and murder and the second book in each series and then brought in the other series. So I see. And when you sold those first two books, right? Like, you know, it's not necessarily common to continue selling books after your first book or two. That's right? true. <laughs> and, and would all of your four series ideas have been tied up as far as rights go? Um, when you saw um, those, or were you going to be free and clear as far as you understood it? I believe in terms of like the actual, like intellectual content of the setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that remains mine to, mm -hmm. you know, and so 
the way the contracts, my contracts are at least, each book that I've sold has included that they have the right of first refusal mm-hmm. on whatever my next book is. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, they don't control, you know, my my intellectual property at all. Yeah, that's cool. That seems like <laughs> maybe you were going into it well informed, or you had yeah. an agent who uh, who looked out for you, or both. Both, I think. Okay, and also, I mean. Daw is a wonderful outfit who just wants to be able to help people tell good stories. So mm-hmm. they're not, they've been a great partner for this sort of process. You know, if I know probably many of your listeners who are hoping to get uh, traditionally published, you can't exactly pick and choose who you're going to, mm-hmm. who's going to purchase your book or want to publish you. But if you can get it, if, if Daw is an option, Daw is a great option. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, well, I'm, I was just putting myself in Dawes' shoes and maybe, you know, naively, since I'm not a publisher, but uh, it seems like a big marketing concept to focus on if you're rolling with an author who has four different series going when, you know, simultaneously as a start in a genre where perhaps series don't always get finished. Right? True. Um, oh, that is definitely true. Which is yeah. another reason why Daw is a great is a great company to work with because mm. they are a big believer in getting series finished, mm. and that's like I I've, I've gotten the impression they would rather have a finished series that maybe wasn't you know a blockbuster seller than two out of three of a series and. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I've. That's that's the impression I've gotten, at least. No. Well, that, that that runs counter to you know <laughs> the common perception of trad pub, and it, but it, on the other side, it makes total sense, right? A series is what has value. A finished right. series. Yeah. I think I think they are they are always seeing that in that sort of long game sort of way mm. that that like a finished trilogy, in the long run, will do better than. Two out of three books. Yeah, yeah. So 2007, you have this huge concept. Yeah. And and I feel like we're telling just half of the story, right? Which is you had a pretty firm idea by that point, what you were doing, it sounds like, and some idea of direction and a game plan is kind of what I'm inferring from from that sequence is pretty tight in the timeline. (laughs) Well, I had already done so much of the world building work. The the mm-hmm. world that that Meridane is set in, like literally the first drawing of the world map was done in nineteen ninety three. Ah, see there we, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it has been this constant level of percolation and fermentation that, that I keep coming back to it, that I kept coming back to it and, and adding to it and fiddling with it and figuring mm. out like I had done the world building work. I had done a lot of the world building work actually because there was a point around in, I want to say in 2000 mm-hmm. where an old friend of mine who was aware of all the world building work I had done had, he had a connection who was this guy who was going to be starting a role-playing game company and wanted to have sort of like a house setting Mm -hmm. for that role-playing game company. Mm -hmm. And so he, my friend put us together and be like, you know, you've done all this, you already have this world set up. So he's thinking this is the right world for this to be the house setting. Mm -hmm. So I did then a lot of, a lot of world building work specifically to that end to make that, you know, a more complete thing for anybody to be able to pick up and, Mm. and jump into that world. That project ended up just sort of fittering away. I don't, I don't even know what happened to that guy. Uh, I just lost track of of what happened. Um, It was one of those, so one of those things where like the, the communication work was being done over, uh, Yahoo groups, if you know you remember that, <laughs> and and like you know Yahoo groups kind of faded away, and there was a certain amount of like if you're not using your Yahoo groups, it's just gone. So that like all of that, 
interaction just vanished mm-hmm. <laughs> into, into the ether. Um, but but so then at that point I had all this work done and then was trying to trying to then be like, okay, if I have all this, I should be writing something in it. And so I wrote two different trunk novels that like both of these novels will not see the light of day. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> that's a promise, but, is it? <laughs> But both of them are kind of are the sort of fantasy novels that are like I have done all this world building work, mm-hmm. and now I'm going to do in text form, and yes. which is not a great place to write a novel from. Like mm. there's because it is based on the idea of I'm going to show you this work that I've done rather than I'm going to tell you this story. Yeah. So the process of writing those did teach me a lot about what a novel is supposed to be as opposed Mm -hmm. to what those were. And so then like I had this sort of flash of inspiration of narrowing my focus into just this one city and the stories that could be told in that city. And then it really was this just sort of burst of inspiration of like, oh, then I could do like this kind of character that does this and these kind of characters that do this and these kind of characters that do that. And I just like wrote that down, like just as just brief notes, like it's like, okay, magic student by day, by day, you know, fighting, fighting against a drug cartel and, you know, two brothers, ex thieves pulled back into it and two cops solving murders. And, mm. and that was just the, the initial inspiration. And, and then, and then from there came up with this idea of using that as a way to tell facets of a larger story of a singular place. Not unlike the way, you know, like the Marvel Universe or the DC Universe, like it's all the same place, but you're getting mm-hmm. radically different kinds of stories mm-hmm. about radically different kinds of characters all within the same setting and mm-hmm. then can have the fun of what happens when you smash those in into each other and and what can happen there. Yeah. And when you have that concept and you know that you're going to write all these stories, are you looking at the environment as a static environment that's kind of globally unchanging for a while? Or like, how are you thinking about change? And then I imagine there's like timeline issues and all these things that come up. Oh, timeline... Timeline is definitely a key thing I'm constantly thinking about and changes a thing I'm constantly thinking about because the more I started to really like find the pieces and put it together, the more I saw not just that change had to happen, Mm -hmm. but that on some level it was what I was doing was a story about a society within the churning roiling yeah i'm gonna start over with that the more i realized i was writing about a society that was in the throes of change Mm -hmm. um and like the best counterpoint i can i can think of that this is a weird one especially for like fantasy writers is the series mad men if you watch if you watch mad men which covered you know the 1960s through the lens of an ad agency right but it really showed you like how much the 60s were this you know this match point for cultural change yeah. that occurs over the course of the series and like everybody's you know everybody's not just everybody's you know clothing and hairstyles but also just outlooks and the way their business is done yeah yeah evolved over the course of the, those years. So I was thinking a lot about, because fantasy is so often about like a status quo and how many, how many fantasy series, especially the famous ones are about, Hey, let's make sure we get back to this yeah. status quo. Yeah. Like, you know, returning, say, you know, the farm boy King to the throne that he deserves because we need this good status quo back. Yeah. And yeah. so I was thinking let's let's go in the opposite let's go through the idea of maybe cultural revolution is occurring Mm -hmm. because i think that's something that fantasy does not do Mm -hmm. often 
Yeah. Um, which which is a shame because I think that is one of the more interesting things to dive into yeah. and challenging all those assumptions of what fantasy needs to be and what it needs to look like. And through that, have a culture be changed over the course of all the books. And I imagine that's, you know, I, I've read a fair bit of fantasy. Like, even if there is a cultural change underway, we're seeing it from kind of like an ivory tower right even if the characters weren't starting in an ivory tower by the end it feels really abstract that change has happened for right for the majority of people who are in the world right right and usually even if there is a change it is usually like okay a bad thing happened and we're gonna fix the bad thing by just going back to the previous good thing yes. before the bad thing. We're, and gonna make, we're gonna make Fantasia great again. We're gonna make fan yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> that is, I mean, the genre can be very I don't want to say it can be very reactionary that mm-hmm. way. That mm-hmm. it is very much and how how many fantasy sagas are there that have the sort of sense of like 10,000 years ago this you know something happened and mm. not much else has happened over the course of yeah. 10,000 years it's static static society, <laughs> right? yeah. and so that that sort of sense of static life is is Im- embedded in the genre mm. and so a lot of what intrigues me is the idea of challenging those notions yeah. and i guess that serves a story if like you're examining if you're using that static world to examine different cultures as they clash within right. a stable ecosystem, right? But in your story, which has four different series lines and they're, you know, related, unrelated, right? Like, does that mean then that you ha- you have room for like not a monoculture but different, different oh, absolutely. ideas to play? And, and maybe the right question to ask to move this forward then is like why what what was so special about this idea in this world to you you know that you were that it stayed with you and then you were motivated to put that much work in um that's a good question like how did why did it just grab onto me like that that yeah, i'm because that's a 15 year journey you're talking about from it the is. first map right and no promise of anything beyond your own edification um, i guess i mean part of it was just this this joy of the creative energy of you know especially on the world building level of just you know coming up with these ideas of what the world was and then evolving that and maturing that sense of you know, because everything started as this sort of like one line description of mm-hmm. like maybe, maybe not necessarily like this real earth culture with the serial numbers filed off, but mm-hmm. not too many degrees removed from that. Sure. And then over the course of of doing the work, enriching each of those things and finding, you know, the greater depth and greater understanding which is which is a process I'm still constantly doing. Mm. I, I where like I will look at a note that I made about a culture or an aspect of the world, you know, nearly 20 years ago and think to myself, wow, that's a really short-sighted way to look at things, isn't it? Mm. And then like, okay, how can I how can I find a more modern way to 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 think about that and and to bring these really you know outdated ideas into into something that's far more interesting and engaging to read now because Mm -hmm. i think the genre as a whole has evolved so much Mm -hmm. in just i mean in just the past five years if not if not the past 10 that to an extent to be remain relevant within this genre and continue to write it. You have to write with the thinking of evolving with it. Mm. What does that, what does that mean? Do you like um, specifically in this 10 years of fantasy genre evolving as you evolve? Well, I mean, to, to a large degree, like the idea that 
you know, 20, even, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, the idea that fantasy essentially was you're going to get something that was essentially Western Europe Mm -hmm. with the serial numbers scrubbed off Mm -hmm. and essentially Middle Ages to Renaissance in time period. Mm -hmm. And like, and if you deviated from that concept, Mm -hmm. then that was a little too weird. And yeah, and probably and probably going to like I have I have a friend who she wrote she wrote her first novel in 2003 and couldn't sell it then and was able to sell it like yeah I mean obviously she did a rewrite and polish and all that but was able to sell it a couple years ago mm-hmm. because at the time they're just like well that's just not what fantasy is you can't there's there's no market for something that's not yeah. that's not you know, and then and all she, all hers was was in terms of like different from the norm was it had it had gunpowder weapons yeah, like yeah. but like that alone was enough to make people like mm, I don't know that's a little too strange but like the idea of what fantasy can be has evolved mm-hmm. so much so you have mm-hmm. things that are flintlock fantasy or secondary world fantasy that is set in radically different time periods like you know like uh Fonda Lee's Jade City which is yeah. which is not only asian in tone but also set in a world that's more akin to like the 1930s to 1950s yeah. and and i knew i saw a lot of people who were just confused at first like wait 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 a second what this isn't like it's like if if it's not historical fantasy like set in an actual city we know, but in the mm-hmm. past, or traditional fantasy set in Europe with the in you know the Middle Ages with the serial numbers mm-hmm. scrubbed off. People just are like, "What is this? I don't understand." And I yeah. think we are reaching the point where you can do all sorts of wild, different, new ideas, and there's not that fear of like, "Oh, I don't get this. What's what's going on?" Which, which is the sort of thing that empowered me to come up with these radical new radical things that I did with velocity of revolution, which is set in a diesel punk setting, which is, Mm. you know, basically sort of a post world war two esque on a technology level, because I wanted, basically I wanted motorcycles and radios as part of, you know, as part of the aesthetic of what I was doing, but so secondary world, secondary world. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the term for a. It's specifically used in fantasy, but anything that's, it's not Earth, but you know where you have to do all that sort of, you know, extra yeah. world building and all that. So, yeah. are you like with the Meridian saga and more recently, like, are you setting this in a secondary world because you just couldn't get enough of a favorite fantasy element to it, or you know, is it or is it also there was an idea, a contemporary real life idea you wanted to explore or issue um, you wanted to explore. I, I don't think there was with Marilyn, I don't think there was a singular issue I wanted to explore. I think more once it was more along the lines of wanting to play with different genres within fantasy mm. and then be so not to box use... yourself in and right. Yeah. Like the Thorn series is, it's basically, it's using the tropes of superhero fiction within fantasy. And the Meriting Constabulary series, which starts with Murder of Mages, that's you know that's a police procedural within mm-hmm. within the concept of fantasy. The Whole Valley Crew and Lady Henderman's Wardrobe and the Fenmere Job, that's a heist series, but set within mm-hmm. the confines of fantasy. So like it was each of those just wanting to sort of play around with what different kinds of stories could be told within the fantasy framework and, mm. and then playing with that. So mm. that's pretty cool. And you, you got paid to kind of play around with your craft and, and yeah. explore. That's, <laughs> that's pretty fancy. Yeah. And so when did you decide that you wanted to write books? Do you um, remember when that was like in the realm of world building and, reading and 
all this not stuff. explicitly but like i do there was no like point where it's like i'm going to you know i there was no point of decision necessarily but there certainly was in terms of that's what i want to do mm. but there certainly was a point of decision of okay i want to do this seriously now because i was doing for a long time i was doing theater as sort of like my primary creative outlet mm -hmm. and then and then that faded for a little while uh, i was still like doing the occasional thing mm -hmm. but i was still talking about like yeah i, I would want to write i would want to write novels at some point mm -hmm. and at one point my wife was just like okay you've been saying that but like why don't you focus your energy on that instead of running the soundboard for somebody's show that you actually don't even mm -hmm. like the show. <laughs> like, why are you doing that instead mm -hmm. of doing, putting your time and energy into the thing you say you want to do? I was like, yeah. Oh, that does, that does make a lot of sense. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Maybe that is what I should be doing. <laughs> so, and that was in the early 2000s. And then, and then in 2007, right around the same time I had that, that explosion of idea, I was also, I was, you know, at that point I was 34 years old working in a job that I just loathed mm -hmm. and, and just didn't, you know, was, had that sort of, you know, crisis of faith or mm -hmm. what have you of like, what am I even doing with my life? Like, you know, I'm, you know, I say I want to write novels, but I've just been sort of puttering with these two things that are both kind of terrible mm -hmm. and, I'm working this job that I do not care the slightest bit about mm -hmm. and actively hate and hate myself when I'm there. And mm -hmm. because I'm doing that, like I can't even half the time muster the, the strength of will to open the file of the book. I'm supposedly mm -hmm. you know, impassioned to write. Mm -hmm. And so it, it did reach the point where I was just like, I you know, like have to do, radical change and talked about mm -hmm. with my wife and left that job and we basically restructured everything about our life which included at the time the business that that we run right now that my wife and i run together is where she teaches spanish classes to children and adults and i do all the administrative work of mm -hmm. running that business while she does the actual teaching mm -hmm. and so at that point in 2007 we're at the point where that was a thing she sort of just did on the side and she was ready to take that mm. to another level so we're like okay let's you know grab hands and jump off the cliff together and just yeah. do radical changes in our life to yeah. make this into something that can be a full-time thing and make not having to work for this horrible job that i hate and be able to focus on the idea that i'm actually going to write novels and put all that together and it, thankfully it has worked out yeah that's amazing well, but but it did take it did take that wild leap of faith that, that when do you remember when that leap of faith was exactly? that was in 2007 it was yeah. in 2007 did you look at each I other i want to say july did you look at each other a couple of years later and go wow what timing we had <laughs> yeah <laughs> the great I mean... depression and you know all that luckily and but you know fortunately that process did work out though yeah. it was it was it was a scary thing to do but it, it ended up for the best so that yeah. was <laughs> and and you're a parent right mm -hmm. and, and you did that in the midst of of raising a child presumably i yes. would imagine that ups the feeling of raising the stakes right oh absolutely yeah but i think it also was a key element of like why we had to raise the stakes and do mm. radical change because you know we because in just in pure like setting a good example mm. of for you know the you know for a son of just living the best possible life we could as opposed to just you know doing what's expected of you and being miserable at it and giving an example of of misery <laughs> which is not the best example so i, I think a, a big part of that was to just you know strive towards giving our best life as opposed to yeah 
as opposed to necessarily the safest choices. Yeah. But that resonates for me. That's that's <laughs> very close to you know decision tree that my wife and I you know made. So and definitely for that reason, right? Like there's some meaning beyond the book sales and the and the dollar figure attached to it. Right. Presumably. Maybe I'm totally wrong. You can tell me I'm wrong. No, no, no. I, I totally wanted to there teach is. my kids that you could make a million dollars selling books. Yeah, that because that's definitely not true. Um, but definitely to teach, you know, do the thing that fires you as opposed to doing the thing that, mm. you know, is supposed to, you know, as opposed to necessarily doing and then mm. being filled with regret. You know. Yeah. So presumably what you're doing fires you or has fired oh, you. Absolutely. Yeah. Or do you have I mean, like, you have moments? Here's like, my Yeah. I was gonna say, I mean, the process of writing sometimes, like, you know, I'm banging my head against the wall and tearing my hair out, but mm. I do at the end of the day, I do love that this is what I get to do and mm. I get to share this stuff with people and see the reactions of the people who read it and love it. And like, that's the part that, that always resonates the most with me and knowing that doing that creates an impact beyond myself. Mm. Like that's, that's the value to me. I mean, yes, you want to make enough money that you don't starve and end up in a gutter, but (laughs) beyond, beyond that it's, it is, the joy of knowing that you're impacting other people and hopefully making their lives a little better along the way. Mm. Mm. Do you ever struggle? Like, oh, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Const- every, you know, at this point I've written 14 novels. Cause I have the 12 of these and then the 13th, actually 16, if you count the two trunked ones and Every single one of them, there is that point, usually between 30,000 and 60,000 words, that is like that scene in the never ending story where the horse is just stopped in the swamp <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> and he's trying to you know, get the horse to. The, the story feels like it's that horse. <laughs> <laughs> and like, As much as I, you know, have like this sort of, you know, larger picture of everything that I want to do and I outline extensively and have this, every single book hits that point Mm. and it's just a matter of pushing through it. But every single one, it's been like, and I'd like to think I've improved my craft with each book and that's part of why I still even hit that wall was because with each book book in you know reaching that point of like is this working is this really coming together Mm. it is that i am constantly coming at it with being stronger what i'm doing and thus the struggle remains because i want to even hit that next tier of of skill Mm. each time you think that contributes to that to so that little oh, yeah. that artex moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like so what's your in terms of like your writing process, do you write through that? Do you ever take a day off and just like give yourself what you need or like how oh, do yeah. you, I mean how do you recover from that? Um for me a big element is always having something else to work on that's mm either a secondary writing project that's, you know, just a thing for the back burner or something else that uses different creative muscles Mm -hmm. so that to let, you know, the part of your brain that hasn't quite figured out that connective tissue in the story, which is holding you up Mm -hmm. can, can rest and, and do its percolation to figure out what it is you need, what what it is I need to do. Mm -hmm. So, Um, like a lot of the time, like, like I said, I, the, the map for the world of Meridane is, you know, that first hand-drawn thing back in 1993 is now 
a Photoshop document that is, you know, half a gig in size with, you know, incredible amounts of detail to mm. it that because that is one of those things like okay i'm just like i'm just gonna play with the map for a while and and add to it more and more um so i do little things like that to sort of reset my brain when things are not mm. working yeah. mm. and are you like maintaining a story bible as you go like how are you Oh, yeah. <laughs> Your listeners can't see this, but, you know, I literally have. I'll put it on you know. YouTube, too, just so people can see the the thick file there. Yeah, I have I have a lot of background and, and detail information that I, you know, constantly, you know, because I just finished writing the an, my 14th novel, which the title is in flux. So I, I, I'm not going to say a title because I don't know what the title is finally going to end up being. Mm. Uh, I, I will just say that the title that we, the title that is we put on the contract was a constabulary of one, which I wasn't entirely crazy about at the time. And the more that I actually wrote the book, the more I'm mm. like, that is so not the title for the mm. story I'm telling. Mm. <laughs> so, so I don't know what the, that title is going to be yet but so i that is set in the same world as all the maridane books but is on the other side of the world mm. um so that was also that was also sort of like a palate cleanser of like let's just you know but in, in a different sort of way of let me do something where i have that sense of familiarity where i've done the world building work but get to do it show something completely different than i've been showing in the maridane books mm. and so when i finished that then the next thing I'm going to be I'm working on that I just got started working on was the fourth book in the Thorn series. And so I totally revamped this saga Bible that I have. And so I, that's what I had spent the first couple of weeks of the year on was just mm. doing that work of mm. like, all right, let's recompile all this. Let's go over all the things and, and, and get things set up that it's, you know, make sure that I, didn't miss something and, and, and just sort of reboot the work for the next phase of things I'm doing with, mm. with these books. So mm. it sounds like you have a pretty patient process. I do. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it patient, you know, just because you've done this a few times or is it patient because that work is still like an important, joyful part of what you're doing that prep work? It's definitely both. Like, I mean, it's patient in the sense of like, I know like that, you know, writing this is going to take this amount of time. And then, and I know I have one spreadsheet that is just like the products I've done, the products I'm currently working on, the products I'm thinking about that I know I'm going to work on in the future. And also mm. the projects I'm thinking about working on in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's got like 63 things on it or something <laughs> absurd like that. Um, and it's part of that is... Handle, <laughs> that's a good way to handle the shiny object. Right. And, yeah. and you know, like I do get the shiny object syndrome yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've, I've learned how to at least tame that beast of the shiny object where like I know when it hits, but I like... I actually have this other book under contract that I need to finish <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to how to do like just enough work to like sort of gel it and put it to the side so it can mm -hmm. like sit in the crock pot and stew for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then like sort of ease that shiny object yeah. draw and like just get it, do enough with it to then be able to then put it aside and then get right. back to right. The thing I'm actually supposed to do. Right. It's time to stir the pot and <laughs> turn it down to a simmer. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you started out. Did you go to school to like be a theater major or like like? I actually was a film student at Penn State. I, uh -huh. That's what my degree is in. Um, but when I was at Penn State, because I did a lot of theater in high school, mm -hmm. and then when I was at Penn State and was you know, like starting the film program. 
after the first two years, like I was literally getting just this sort of itch of like, I got to do something more because mm. the way the film program worked there, you really didn't get started on anything until in terms of like making projects. Mm. And this was, you know, in the early nineties where we actually, like we actually did shoot on film and like have mm-hmm. like, at least a couple of the projects literally edited with the, you know, strips of film where you slice it you cut and tape, tape it again. For the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so it's not like I, I joke because my, my son, he's currently a film student, but also like his high school film classes, the fact that there were high school film classes were had access to significantly better equipment and materials and mm-hmm. and and resources than we had in college in the 90s just because of you know the way the technology has yeah. vastly improved over the course of the past 25 years but but so going to my junior year i just was like i just need to do something more with you know and i just got this wild idea that i'm just like i'm just gonna put on a production of 12th night like, mm. like I just had this like idea of like this is what I'm gonna do, and I like just like put up signs around the the dorm that I lived in and got people to audition. He was like doing rehearsals and didn't know where it was gonna be. <laughs> like, mm. like, like when are we gonna do this and where are we gonna? I don't even know yet. But then like slowly like work that out and we put that up, and that was such an undertaking that like I was on the verge of tearing my hair out near the end of that. <laughs> But, like, as soon as, like, we finished, like, and we just, you know, did two shows on a Friday and Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that was done, it was like, okay, what are we doing next? I'm like, oh, this has become a what are we doing next sort of thing. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then that evolved into basically a whole, like, sort of underground theater company mm-hmm. at Penn State that is still there today, or at least, it, you know, was before the pandemic hit. I don't know mm. what's going on there literally right now, but at least it had kept going through 2020 and was wow. you know, had become a, a fully fledged, you know, student organization. That's really cool. <laughs> Are you comfortable naming what that is? It, is? it was, the name is no refund theater at Penn state. And I'm pretty sure. It's <laughs> uh, a good name. Does that mean then that you took a took a gate, took an admission gate? We had like a dollar suggested admission or something like that back at the time, or no. <laughs> it was something like that. But uh, looks like they're oh, they they did not have any fall shows, which you know makes sense. But they no. do, they they there's I'm just finding it, literally an article in the school paper of their decision to not have fall shows. So clearly exists. they're they're organized enough for to to put out a, a press release of saying <laughs> we're not going to have shows. That's something. So that's cool. That's a lot of fun. And yeah, I listened to as I was prepping. I listened to uh, one of your podcasts, and it's called. What is it called? World Building for Masochists. Okay. And is it really for masochists? Well, the idea is, yeah, that it's for... Our target audience is the sort of fantasy writer or or gamer or, you know, any kind of writer or gamer Mm -hmm. that wants to do that sort of level of world building thought Mm -hmm. that it's probably more than you'll ever actually need to Mm -hmm. write or play or whatever you're like that. The work you feel is necessary Mm -hmm. beyond what's going to end up necessarily on the page. And that can be a good thing to do, especially when you recognize like, like when I talked about that, you know, of of those two trunk novels, they were both sort of like, well, I've done this work. Now I need to show it to you. And I think part of that, our ethos is yeah you're going to do all this work so that you the you know the creator of this work have a greater sense of the depth that you want mm. but there's also the knowledge that you don't need to show all that work yeah. <laughs> that you've done yeah. but 
but that is that is the idea of like that just the joy of doing the world building work in and of itself yeah. is going to be yeah. even though it's a lot of work is going to be a lot of fun well one of the things that that turned my ear was uh you mentioned uh what was called a mush with the theme <laughs> from david eddings and this is how I know that we're of an age, right? Like, because I know what I know what a mush is, and and but I want you to explain this because I feel like this must have enriched your life in some way. Or I'm assuming this happened during college. It did uh, happen during college. I don't know if enriched my life is necessarily the correct or helped you fl- flunk a course or two at least. Come on, I was going to say it probably. <laughs> It probably distracted my life, but um, so what those were. This is this is in the the, you know, nascent days of the internet. I think before you could ever type in HTTP something something. Yeah, you might have been using places. a link links browser or something. Right. Yeah. Um, but it was basically sort of like a mush. Like I forget what the letters stand for. Like it's multi-user something something. Probably, sim- <laughs> and, probably a simulated something. Yes. Simulated hell. <laughs> <laughs> but so the idea was basically like the concept of a text adventure game that was multi-user. Mm-hmm. So everybody involved could then contribute to the building of it or at least it depended Mm on you know how it was run and who the administrators were and what they wanted but like the idea of like you can then it was joint storytelling in a weird way in in that sort of sense of like like creating this sort of text adventure space to then interact with other people and and then do a role-playing game that way yeah. No. So it has the world, uh, you know, it's interesting to me because it has the world building elements that you might associate with, say, creating a role tabletop role playing game. But right. it also has the interactive storytelling piece where people are, you know, actually creating stories, right? Or scenes and right. on the fly, almost like a first draft experience. Very much like a first draft experience. And I remember at least one of the ones I was on, I don't remember too much about it, but like I was I was sort of roped in to be not an admin, but like one of the one of the, you know, part of the management team, I guess is the best mm-hmm. I forget the specific term. But so the character I played was going to be like the ruler of a certain region. Mm. And so then I was responsible for like building up that region and, and probably then, approving people's character and, and approving ideas. people's characters and stuff, things like that. Yeah. And so the person who had their primary, but the primary idea behind it, like they had like their sort of their, their world building Bible of what the different areas were, but very, you know, very loose. And the thing I remember is then, probably to avoid doing my actual like homework and going to classes like <laughs> I was supposed to. Um, uh-huh. I ended up putting a lot of work into building my area, which was like supposed to be like a subsection of a part that's not that important to the story that mm-hmm. this the person behind it all had heard it envisioned. And but like none of the other admins he and or managers or whatever that he brought on were, you know, because they were probably busy college students who actually paid attention to their homework, <laughs> were putting that same kind of energy into the bits that they were doing. Mm. So I I do remember the like one of the the upper admins being like, wow, there's a lot of work here, which isn't supposed to be like the key part. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> that's, like, You're like I w- didn't ask for a whole iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was part of like I didn't ask for a whole iceberg, but it, yeah. I think it was also like I wish the other people I brought in on this had mm. done so that everything would be at this level. Yeah. Like I remember, oh, this is a weird bit of memory from that, but I remember 
with whoever was like doing sort of the more of the hard coding of it Mm. created a system where characters needed to eat or they'd get hungry and fall, you know, and, but then because, and then like made the coding for like a thing that makes like something that is recognized as food Mm. Like I, I I don't remember the legit, but I just remember the way that I ended up working out is my area ended up being the only place that actually had food. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so then yeah. I had like an almost an, an overwhelmed number of like new people who joined who made their characters live in my area just because yeah. that's where there was food. <laughs> that's 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 your hallmark. So did you bring that? Did you bring that into your um, to your fiction, the Meridane saga, to your character? Well, I, I have always been. Uh, do you have Do you have an iceberg salad in, <laughs> in, in the Meridane saga? I don't have an iceberg salad because you know, but I do do a lot with food in terms of food as a world building tool. But that's also because I'm you know an amateur chef and I just love fiddling with food and cooking all the time anyway. So that's, mm. you know, that's just a thing I'm passionate about. I don't know if that's necessarily why that area that much ended up being the one. Pl- I think that's just because I was the only one who had bothered to like set something up for the guy who created food coding to like place a food cart <laughs> rather than yeah. necessarily my own love of foodiness as a element of. This explains a lot about how you ended up behind the soundboard, right? Like, <laughs> The person who showed up on time. Every yeah. Day. Cool. So yeah, we're getting, we're close to time here, but a um, couple questions. You can answer them any way you like. You can even sure. omit one, but like, I guess what's ahead for you? Like, what are you looking forward to? And then to ch- make this challenging, I would ask if you couldn't ever publish a book again, what would you do? <laughs> wow that's that's harsh um that's a good question i don't know what i would do like if i you're allowed to could... figure it out right now popcorn style i mean what would i do if i could like like i mean you could keep writing them you yeah know. the question is what are we how are we defining couldn't because you know <laughs> there was no financial incentive mm. i think even with no financial well it depends but like, because I do have sort of my my larger scheme of what I want to do, and I think, regardless, I would try and find a way to like get those stories done and out mm. there, mm. even if it wasn't necessarily going to be traditionally published. And I think I've like built up enough of a brand that I could at least make that worth worthwhile, if nothing else. Mm. But. Like when you said if you couldn't publish another book again, like that, that put me in the mind of like you know something tragic has occurred and you literally can't write it anymore or something like. That. Like the only way for me it would be like you couldn't anymore is if I literally had just gotten so somehow frozen or stuck up or otherwise unable to write another book. That mm. some major rainforest company takes revenge preemptive re- revenge for the deconstruction of a monopoly and buys up all the printing presses and all the publishers and says adios no so this grand scheme i mean that's maybe that's what i'm fishing for like this grand scheme idea oh there's definitely a grand scheme idea so the books that are out right now in meridane hmm. those represent like those 12 books represent phase one and then I have a phase two and a phase three planned. I'm just now starting the first book, writing the first book that would be um, the first book in phase two. Mm. But I do have a whole, I do have a whole plan there for that. So, and nice. I'm hopefully going to be able to, to do everything in that plan and have it work out. Now, of course, and I have a plan, but the plan always has to be fluid because. Mm. Like I said, the the genre has changed and evolved so much over the past 10 years, and I can see it continue to do that. So mm-hmm. even though I've got 
this you know plan that in theory won't be done until 2032 or something <laughs> you know like it's got to be a plan that can be nimble and find ways to evolve with the genre or else hmm. or else it gets stuck i mean i don't want to call out anybody specific who has not finished things but i think if if i'm gonna play like sort of like hmm. armchair psychiatrist i think part of the challenge many of those writers have had is that the genre has changed under their feet hmm. so that what they've been working on doesn't necessarily finding how to end what they're doing hmm. in a way that works now is a big challenge mm. Mm. and i respect that that is a very big challenge and understand why that that is such a big challenge yeah yeah so what i notice in every <laughs> answer is you continue to write books yeah you know and obviously there's many storytelling you know mediums out there right there's video games there's movies there's probably other things not thinking of right so have you I become mean, would... have you become attached to like the writing of books i think part of that to a degree yes but i think part of that ties into like when i was doing theater and i would like if i wrote a play which i did a couple of times then like there's the whole process of okay now i've written this now i need to like actually produce it and mm -hmm. either direct it or get something directed and like get actors and get them you know and so a lot of that process i found very i mean i it was an enjoyable process but it was also very harrowing yeah and so the sort of the joy of books is that I don't need to drag anybody else into it. Mm. <laughs> In term, like, yeah. yeah, there is like, of course, obviously I have, you know, the, the whole team at DAW who is part of the process of actually getting the books out there and all that, but it is more on me. And I definitely, I can, I know myself well enough to know, like one of my, personality flaws is i tend to be that person who like when when i'm in a crunch moment mm. and somebody comes up to me is like hey you know do you need something can, you know what, what can i do to help and i will say nothing nothing don't worry about it because in my brain i and this is wrong and i know this is like a thing i need to work on there's the part of me that goes okay i can either explain to you what i would need you to do to help or I can just do it mm -hmm. and it would take about the same amount of time. <laughs> so I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and that's probably not the healthiest way to go about life, but it is the thing I tend to do. And in writing books, as opposed to saying producing theater or, you know, filmmaking or anything like that, which I, I am still interested in the idea of writing for TV or writing for movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. And though I would love for somebody to just like take this and, pay me money and adapt it to film or TV or whatever. That be, well, that, there you go. Cause that, that'd be great too. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, I am interested in working in those mediums, but, but we'll see, you know, it's, it's not something I've put a lot of super active pursuit into because this is a medium where I have the most control over yeah. what the final output is. Yeah. Well, and you get to see it finished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's huge value. Um, second to last question. Is there anybody we should be reading if we're, like, looking to see where fantasy is going, like, right now, that, that you were excited about or impacted by? Um, certainly, you know, if people, if you're, you haven't read Fonda Lee, her Jade City, her Greenbone Saga yet, mm -hmm. Definitely should. Um, what else? Um, I just, I read in proofs, like it doesn't come out until March, but it is C.L. Clark's The Unbroken, which is, that was an excellent book and I heartily recommend it. And which is why I wrote a, a blurb on it saying 
I heartily recommend it. <laughs> um, is that let's C see. L letters or C L? C L is letters. The French yeah. name. Yeah, okay. Nice. <laughs> um, what else? What else? Um, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't recommend my co-hosts on World Building for Masochists, Rowena Miller and Cass Morris. Mm. Both of them write really intriguing different different kinds of fantasy. Um, Cass writes. Her current series is more historical fantasy set in an alternate Rome with magic. Mm. And and Rowena wrote a story that's sort of like revolutionary France with magic, but you know, but secondary world. And both are really cool series that people should read. And so that's you know, cool. So of course I'm gonna plug them because you know <laughs> Yeah. And now they're my co hosts. <laughs> and now here's the chance to plug yourself. Which is for people who want to learn more about you or read your books, how can they find you? Okay, so again, um, my website is mrmareska.com. That's M A M A M R M A R E S C A dot com. I am on Twitter as at Marshall Maresca. And like those are the main places to find me. I mean, like I have an Instagram, I have Facebook, I use neither one of them particularly much or well mm -hmm. um and my books are the you know if you google the maradine saga m-a-r-a-d-a-i-n-e you mm -hmm. can find all 12 of those and then of course my upcoming velocity of revolution which is a diesel punk fantasy which comes it looks out like February it may 9th. have looks like it may have violence and motorcycles in it as a content does. warning Oh yeah, it's, I, I'm getting that from the cover. <laughs> it definitely no, that's definitely all the Meridane books. Like, if you wanted me to put it in movie terms, are PG 13s and Velocity is definitely an R. I, I've warned some some people, especially I know I have some younger fans, and I have at least one where it's an old friend from college and mm. her daughter are both big fans, and I'm like. This book, <laughs> maybe not so much. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but at least, you know. TVMA, made for HBO. Yeah, that's, yeah. it's a little more, I mean, but I'm a big believer in, like, everything you do should, you know, should up your game. Everything you should do mm -hmm. should, should scare you a little. And so... <laughs> Like you should constantly be, I try to constantly push myself further out of my comfort zone each time. And so writing this book was definitely a, a test of that mm. thesis. And, and, and I'm really glad I did it. That's awesome. Well, Marshall, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Fearless Storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover the Fearless Storyteller podcast.